Good afternoon, evening, uh, good morning uh, to where you folks are uh, across the globe. Uh, my name is Mike DeHealy. I'm the moderator for the panel, Filipinos in Government, Who's on the Table, Who's on the Menu? And this is uh, presented by the National Federation of Filipino American uh, Organization Associations. Um, with me this uh, today, um, we have four panelists uh, across the United States who will be able to um, talk about uh, Filipinos in government and share some perspectives about uh, what you, um, you know, what their experiences are in terms of their work in public service, as well as uh, provide a, an opportunity for you folks to ask questions down the line um, at the end of the session concerning uh, anything that you want uh, regarding uh, Filipinos and public service. Let me go through and uh, announce, um, go through the biographies of each of the panelists. I'll start off with uh, Josh Price. Um, he is from Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, if you can wave Josh, uh, that'd be great. Um, you know, he, his mother is a registered nurse from Rojas City uh, who was recruited to work in rural Arkansas. During his career in government communications, he served with federal agents, the federal agencies, the Delta Regional Authority, and the US SBA. He's been elected to two terms as the elected commissioner for Pulaski County in Arkansas, where he also oversee elections for his 400,000 residents. Josh was the first Filipino American and Asian American to serve in this position and was one of only five AAPI government officials in Arkansas at the time. Uh, Josh has been nationally recognized for his work on smooth, running smooth and fair elections, and he's been on panels combating voter suppression. Um, and I, and I, okay. uh, he is the co-founding president of the AAPI Democratic Caucus of Arkansas, and during his time as 2020 president of PhilPro, uh, he helped to raise tens of thousands of dollars to purchase and distribute PPE, food, and other toiletries to underserved uh, Filipino American communities across the nation uh, during the pandemic. Um, a short war story that he did share about dealing with the public, that he would receive numerous calls from candidates who were tattling on each other when they were standing within 100 feet of the polling place. Um, he told the candidates to please follow the election law, takes the signs down, but he had really no power to enforce that request. So um, he was busy. So since then, um, since defacing public property fell under the city's purview and they were busy with other duties. Uh, in the 2022 elect grant, uh, well, 2020 general election, there were two large trucks with political signs for certain presidential candidates that were parked in front of two busy polling stations. So he had to contact the police to get both of those trucks towed. So um, that's one of his war stories. Uh, his favorite karaoke song is A Whole New World or Take Me Home Tonight. He is a fan of 1980s music. So let's go ahead and welcome Josh to uh, this afternoon's panel. Uh, next, we have uh, Jessica Caloza. She's the commissioner for uh, the Board of Water, Public, uh, Board of Public Works, which is the governing and oversight body for nearly 6,000 employees for delivering critical services and infrastructure for 4 million residents um, in Los Angeles. She's appointed by um, LA Mayor Eric Garcetti and confirmed by the City Council in 2019, and she's the first Filipina to serve on that board. Previously, she served as a member of Mayor Garcetti's executive team, and prior to joining that office, she served in the Obama administration in the U.S. Department of Education. Um, she has been a campaign aide to several members of Congress, including uh, former Rep. Bracero, who is now a, a cabinet secretary. In, in 2012, she was a community organizer for President Obama's campaign and helped lead key offices in Virginia. She's, she serves on various boards, including the California Democratic Party, Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, and Filipino American Los Angeles Democrats. Jessica graduated from USC San Diego with the low major in political science, international relations, and ethnic studies. Um, one of her stories is that when she had her first campaign job with President Obama's re-election campaign, campaign um, they asked what state I wanted to, what she wanted to work in, and she let them know that she would do anything for the president. So they sent her to Virginia, a battleground state where they were trying to flip it blue for the first time in decades. At first, it was intimidating organizing a, uh, a community in a state that she had never been to, but then adapted and built strong relationships uh, in the community. It was an opportunity to well, a lifetime to work in Charlottesville and organize one of the biggest rallies in the state for the president with over 7,000 people. And she said she'd do it again in a heartbeat. Her favorite karaoke song is uh, TLC, No Scrubs. So let's go ahead and welcome Jessica to this afternoon's panel. Next, we have uh, Sergio Acobilia, who he is uh, the 2022 Democratic candidate for Hawaii's first congressional district, encompassing urban Honolulu. Uh, previously, Sergio served as an attorney and a director of external relations for the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit, uh, where, which is a public interest law firm, where he was recognized locally and nationally as a leader in improving access to justice for the most vulnerable. 
Um, Sergio serves on various committees of the Hawaii Access to Justice Commission, is a board director of the Hawaii Filipino Lawyers Association, and is a second year of serving on the Field Pro Board. Also, as a member of the Hawaii Work Center, a nonprofit organization that advocates for the rights of low wage and immigrant workers, Sergio has dedicated his time during the pandemic to helping unemployed workers fight for their unemployment benefits. He is a graduate of the University of Florida with a double major in political science and economics, holds a master's degree in religious education from the Unific Unification Theological Seminary, and has a law degree from the University of Hawaii at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Uh, he was born in Iloilo, where he emigrated to the U.S. when he was seven years old and currently resides in Honolulu with his wife and two children. In his spare time, he loves playing basketball and cheering on his Florida Gators. One of his favorite war stories is that um, as he was canvassing and fundraising for a nonprofit organization somewhere in, in Utah, he realized that there wasn't anyone that looked like him in this neighborhood, and it felt that it was only a matter of time before the police showed up. Sure enough, they were there to greet him a few houses later. Um, he, he did not. He was happy to not get arrested that day, but had a share of police rights and police stops going door to door and canvassing with a, a bunch of other states. Um, his favorite was stopping uh, in a town where the mayor was asking him for a donation. Um, he didn't know who he was, but he asked uh, him to follow him to his office, and, and he had him fill out a permit. It was great finding out that he was actually the mayor, and even better when he made a donation, all the name of uh, the name was a good cause. Uh, his favorite karaoke song is uh, Juicy by Notorious B.I.G. So, uh, Sergio, welcome to uh, the panel this afternoon. Lastly, we have Stephen Raga. He's a uh, so Stephen joined Woodside on the Move as executive director in 2021 and most recently served as Northeast Regional Manager for Policy and Advocacy for the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation, uh, Chief of Staff at the New York State Legislature and a Senior Strategist for Multicultural Leadership at AARP. Currently, he is also a New York State Advisory Committee member for the U.S. Federal Commission on Civil Rights, appointed under President Obama, where he has conducted uh, conducted investigations on housing, policing, urban education, and uh, prison reform. He sits on the boards of Queens LGBT Pride, National Urban Fellows Alumni, um, National Federation for Filipino American Associations, Filipino American Democratic Club of New York, and Filipino American Unity for Progress, or UNIPRO, which he founded in 2009. Stephen has been elected twice as NYC's Queens uh, County Committeeman, and he was a candidate in the 2021 New York City City Council Democratic Primary. He holds appointments as a member of Queens Community Board 2 and the Queens District Attorney Advisory Commission for Asian American Affairs, as well as an Emerging, Mar Emerging Markets Institute Fellow at the Cornell S.C. Johnson College of Business. Previously, he's con completed fellowships at Cornell Law School, uh, CNY Institute for State and Local Governance, New American Leaders, uh, National Urban Fellows, we are all New York Queens Fellowship and the Coral New York Immigrant Civic uh, Leadership Program. He's a recipient of, of numerous awards, and uh, he is also an outstanding graduate student award at um, at Cornell University. So let's go ahead and work, welcome Stephen to uh, today's panel. So um, as we have uh, NAFA as one of uh, the sponsors of this particular session, and we're going to go ahead now and. Uh, play a video, uh, hopefully I can get this to work, uh, concerning uh, running for office. So uh, please let me know if you're unable to uh, see the video and I will work on that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anjanette Wilson, and today my partner here, I'm Alyssa Barkeen, and we're here to work to present NAFA's Run for Office program. So let's go ahead and get started. So who is NAFA? NAFA is a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization. It's one of the largest national affiliations of Filipino American institutions, organizations, and individuals. NAFA's mission is to promote the welfare and well-being of Filipino Americans throughout the United States by amplifying their voices, advocating on behalf of their interests, and providing resources to facilitate their empowerment. So let's go ahead and meet the team. Like I said, my name is Anjanette Wilson. I'm one of NAFA's interns, and I'm based in Seattle, Washington. And again, I am Alyssa Barkeen. I'm, of course, another NAFA intern, and I'm located in San Francisco, California. A couple of our teammates, like the other interns, are here in the audience, Gladys, Mark, and Ben. The executive director is Chris Avia Corda. 
And then our tech design for these sessions were from our lovely between. And then most of our sessions were hosted by Lauren Gregory. So these sessions, the key goals of each were one, to connect Filipino Americans who are thinking of running for office with current and former Phil M public officials. Another goal for these sessions were to connect these public officials and to provide them a space to share how others can run a successful campaign and make a positive difference in our community and country. And lastly, it provides a space to share for the public officials to share lived experiences and knowledge for learning opportunities for attendees. These sessions were promoted through social media platforms for engagement, marketing, and announcing these sessions. A couple of the social media platforms used were Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. But most of our sessions were recorded on Zoom and Facebook Live. And these class platforms were provided twice a month for one hour each from starting in August and ending in December 9th and of a total of 10 sessions. And now Alyssa will talk about our speaker officials. Yes, thank you, Anjanette. So um, each member office session does feature a resource speaker who is a current or former Filipino American elected official. And so for our first session, we had former mayor and council member Ray Buenaventura talking about setting the stage, um, just giving us a little introduction. Second session was former candidate Christina Osmania, um, who specializes in voter communications. Session three was tech expert Rafi Castillo, um, and his topic was everything is digital, integrating the tech and data into campaigns. Moving on for session four, we had delegate Chris Calderona, who talked about how to balance life as a public servant. Session five, was um, we featured Alex Walker Griffin, who talked about how to reach your voters online. And our most recent session featured Assembly Member Rob Fox, who talked about life in public service. And so next, we're going to transition to a little video that shows a preview of what some of our member office sessions are like. Thank you, Carissa, and thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you all and chat with you all today. And hopefully, uh, you know, I can learn something from you all. And, you know, some of the stuff that I've been through, you can all learn from me. And just even as a resource, I'd love to help you all out. So my name is Alex Walker Griffin. I'm a member of the Hercules City Council. So I'm excited to be here and um, just share the opportunity to talk about how you went for office. And then even after that, once you get into office, what you need to do to be successful. But what do I do now in city council? What prompted that was that same spark that when I had when I was 18, where I said, you know what? In order to be the change, you kind of have to be the person to behind the dice. You know, you have to be that person who's willing to say, you know what? I want to stick up for my community. And because I've lived in Hercules literally since I was six years old, it's basically the only town I've ever known. You know, I decided, hey, if I'm going to run for office, it has to be my hometown because that's what's going to be most authentic. And you all hear about talk about that in a little bit with these slide decks. So this is something that I think is going to separate um, us, you know, Gen Z folks and some of us millennials out there when you get your message out there. So I like the experiences that make me unique. So first off, my city is 116 years old. I am the first and only council member to have actually grown up in the city and serve on the city council. So I can literally tell you what it's like to be a kid and play the park or right down the street from the future. I can tell you what it's like to go to that library right across the street that I remember opening when I was in elementary school. So things like that. Also, if you're like me, you know, I'm on the younger end, the second closest council member to my age is 42. You can talk about what makes you unique and age is a really big thing that helps you stand out. And I've talked to you younger folks out there. The reason why is because you've actually lived that experience and a lot of policy issues are going to be directly impacting you. So again, just be yourself and campaign on stuff that's stuff that you really believe in. And no matter which way it goes, at the end of the day, if you just campaign, and you were fair and you were honest, that's the best thing that you can do. Because I will say this, you may not win the first time, but if you're just honest about yourself, um, you are you always win. You, there's no such thing as actually losing an election. You just didn't get the elected spot. But it was stuff that I kind of think about all the time and that I wish I kind of had known when I initially ran for office. So um, I guess it's time for questions now. So I'm more than open and happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. 
Hey, Council Beta, I, I, I just wanted to interject here and just say ditto to everything you said from, uh, you know, watching yourself compromise and, uh, you know, being innovative. So uh, coming both from like the staffer perspective and uh, candidate perspective, you know, yeah, you, you hit all the marks there. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm going to be looking out for that race too. I'm going to be looking out for this. Now it's time for the participants of the Run for Office program to introduce themselves. They will be stating their name the city where they're from, the position they're running for or intend to run for, and why they want to run for office. Well, hello everyone, I'm Lashley Oster, I'm from Bethesda, Maryland. I'm just excited to return back to the political process because I'm always in, in, involved in politics and on the campaign side, and I hope that one day I do run for Maryland's 8th Congressional District. Musta kayong na lahat. Everyone, uh, my name is Corlito Almeida. I'm a lifelong Democrat uh, running for the General Assembly in District 39, which is in New Jersey. Uh, you know, a lot of decisions are being made uh, by people that don't look like us. You know, I want to make sure that we got a seat at the table. Hello, good evening, everybody. It's nice to be here to be able to spend some time with everyone who has the same concern as all the Filipino American who is running for a position. And um, I'm a newbie when it comes to politics because I, when I retired, the seat for school board of education got open and I've been anticipating to be seated. And so I'm seated now as a school board member for school board of education at Roland Unified School District. Oh my gosh, I got so emotional when you guys were talking about money that I started chatting on there. And Lashley, you're from Bethesda. You look quite familiar to me. Have we met in Annapolis? Because I swear you look familiar to me, but um, good luck on the congressional race. Uh, Carlito, kudos. Um, everything you've said, I, I'm really rooting for you. Uh, and Miss Agnes, congratulations on your appointment to the school board. And I look forward to seeing you in other positions following that. I have to say this is probably one of the most enjoyable forums I've done. I find this more near and dear to my heart because this is NAFA and it's promoting us. Now we can take our class photo. One, two, three, smile. Awesome, that was a great video. Uh, Let's go ahead and get back to this. So awesome, these class sessions were very engaging and very educational. And these candidates were able to self-assess if running for office is a fit to their current situation or the foreseeable future. They were also able to understand the logistics in running political and fundraising campaigns. They were also able to make effective presentations to constituents, financial backers, and other people involved in contributing to the campaign. We sent out Google Forms after every session and we usually got student reflections back. One student has said, this dialogue is so important. I wish more people could hear these messages and participate in this process beyond just being Filipino. Others have said this was a fantastic session. Everything is perfect. Another person said, I enjoy the candid conversations we have. Lastly, the other, another person said, directness and honesty of the presenters. Very helpful how open they are. We thank you so much for listening to our presentation and video, and now we'll take any questions. Okay, um, thank you, Nafa, for providing that video, and again, being a, a sponsor of uh, PhilProCon this year. So we certainly um, appreciate that, uh, that piece that you put together for us. So to get into the panel, um, it's a it's a fortune. I guess I'm fortunate to actually have a planning department under my um, under my belt, and so I asked them to put together a, a few slides just to help prime the discussion this afternoon, evening, morning uh, about um, you know just the status of Filipinos in the United States, and then taking some in information from the U.S. Census uh, and the most recent American Community Survey. So let me walk through a brief PowerPoint just to kind of. Uh, get some stats on the board and we can start going into a uh, discussion with our panelists. So just a, a few kind of tidbits. Um, let's see. 
So right now, you know, according to the last U.S. Census, which was just last year, uh, and not including mixed race um, individuals, Filipinos uh, account for about three million of the United States population. So just to kind of put that into context, um, you know, if you were to have all Filipinos be in one state, it would be the 35, 35th largest state in the United States. Um, and if you just kind of compare it to what's smaller, and some notable uh, you know states that are smaller than the amount of Filipinos in the United States, and uh, including uh, my home state of Hawaii. Um, in terms of the census data of, of or place of birth or place of origin, uh, 1.8 million of those uh, were born in the Philippines. 50% uh, of adults actually have a bachelor's degree or higher. And you know what's interesting is that you compare that it's 33% of the general U.S. population. When you get into uh, it's English as a second language, 63.7% uh, of uh, Filipinos do speak another language. Uh, Occupation-wise, 45% are in management, business, science, and the arts. So it's a very you know, large percentage of those working adults that are uh, in these trade fields. Uh, median household income, over 100,000. So that's you know, compared to 53,800 uh, uh, 53, nationwide. So you know, the, the household income for Filipinos is, is markedly higher than uh, those as, as a natural average. My state, uh, Filipinos, uh, uh, consists of 60% of, of Hawaii's population, which is the largest. Uh, in terms of numbers, California has the largest amount of, of Filipino concentration at about 1.2 million people. Uh, and when you're looking at voter turnout, breaking it down by, by Filipino specific versus uh, non-Hispanic Asians, what you'll see is that compared to whites and blacks, they actually um, are behind in terms of voter participation as recent as the 2020 presidential election, and this is directly from uh, the U.S. Census Bureau Population Survey. Given that, um, we'll go ahead and get started this uh, with the, the panel discussion, and um, I want to go ahead and get started with Josh, and uh, we've allotted 10 minutes for each uh, panelist to talk about or present anything that they want to, and they're not going to use potentially that, that full amount of time, but it's available for them to uh, share their views or, or give a discussion about um, Filipinos and government. And so we'll go ahead and get started with Josh. This, uh, um, go ahead, Josh. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, and uh, Mabuhai, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Again, my name is Joshua Ong Price. I grew up in a very small town in Arkansas uh, called Delight. Um, it's Delight, but they pronounce it Delight. Um, so just a little bit about me and the reasons why I got into public services. Um, my mom was a nurse that came over from the Philippines in the 70s, which is a very typical story. And um, she, I remember her telling me how uh, during that time in the Philippines, um, President Marcos had declared martial law and she was living in Manila. She had just finished up nursing school at, uh, at uh, Philippine Women's University. And uh, she said she remembers there being nine o'clock curfews and um, only two TV stations. She doesn't remember seeing a newspaper for three years. So when she saw that flyer um, on the hospital wall looking for nurses in the United States, uh, she didn't know where she was going, but she thought, um, I want to see my future children have, have freedom to vote and freedom to make their voice heard and freedom of speech. So she took a chance and they put her in, um, recruited her and moved her to little old Murfreesboro, Arkansas. It's a very small town where she met my father and eventually um, got married and had, had me and my sister. But uh, growing up in a, a rural town in, in southwest Arkansas, um, I believe we were the only Asian Americans in our immediate vicinity, maybe the whole county. And um, I just grew up not really seeing anybody that looked like me um, in general, but definitely not in any position of leadership. Um, and then when we moved to, to Little Rock, which is the capital city of Arkansas, it's a little larger, um, you know, a little bit more urban and diverse. We did plug into the local Filipino population. Uh, there's about 8,000 Filipino Americans in Arkansas. Uh, but at the same time, I, I still did not see anybody that looked like me in any positions of authority or any positions of leadership. Um, all, all the Filipinos I saw were, were nurses or doctors or engineers, uh, very typical. Um, but I was really inspired to get involved in public service by my grandmother on my father's side. She was the um, first female justice of the peace of Pike County, which is a very small county of about 8,000 people, uh, one of six justices of the peace. And um, she was a um, very active leader in civil rights at the time. And uh, my father would tell me stories about how she would officiate weddings in her home for African-Americans during segregation. Uh, when these folks were not allowed to use public buildings. Um, and so even though she was a Caucasian woman, 
um, she was standing in the gap for other people and she was opening doors for other people, even though they didn't look like her, uh, because it was her belief that in that position, she's representing everybody in her county, not just certain people. And I found out later that uh, she actually received death threats at the time for doing what she did. And uh, people were not happy with that, but she ended up staying in that position for 20 years and running unopposed. So apparently people thought she did a good job, but that, that courage and that bravery to, to stand up um, for yourself and for other people really stuck with me. Um, and so I, I started getting involved um, in my community, in nonprofits originally. I really never thought I would get involved in a political career. I, I did work um, for the government, um, for the federal government, for the U.S. Small Business Administration and the Delta Regional Authority. And I thought that was a great way to do good. But as far as myself getting involved in, in government, it, it wasn't really something that was um, on my radar, so to speak. But um, I was trying to work with different nonprofits to affect change in my community. And what I realized at a certain point was that all this amazing work that nonprofits are doing, um, it's a Band-Aid. It was a Band-Aid on our society. And unless the laws are changed and the policies are changed, people are going to continue to fall through those cracks. So you could have as many nonprofits helping with early childhood education, but if there's not funding for early childhood education, then you're going to continue to, to just try to try to fill that gap. Um, there was a lot of issues with domestic violence. You know, you can have as many uh, uh, battered women's shelters as you'd like, but if there's no laws to combat domestic violence, it's going to continue to happen. So what really got me involved in, in government and politics was on the policy side, trying to affect change. Um, so working for these different federal agencies, working for our, uh, with our state and our governor, um, we were able to get some good things accomplished. But again, I still didn't see anybody that looked like me. And um, everywhere I would go, um, with my boss, who was a form, former uh, appointee under President Obama, I was the only Asian American, you know, in the room, the only Filipino American. And um, just a little story, because uh, my, my former boss, uh, his name is Chris, he was really been a mentor to me. And he said something one time that when we were working together that really stuck with me to this day. So we were traveling all through um, the, the Delta, which is the uh, part of the country that borders the Mississippi River. Um, I was working for the Delta Regional Authority at the time, which was an economic development agency covering eight states and 10 million people. So I was uh, traveling with my boss and we traveled three to four days a week. Um, I was his digital communications director and uh, policy advisor. And um, as we were traveling back from a, a meeting, I believe in Alabama, uh, he, he turned to me in the car and he said, you know, Josh, um, I just have a question for you. He said, I don't know what it's like being Asian American. I don't know what it's like being Filipino American. And I don't know what it's like for you when we're in these small rural towns that are predominantly white um, or sometimes predominantly black and you're the only person that looks like you. He said, are, are you okay? Is everything fine? And I said, yeah, I'm kind of used to it at this point, especially in these types of circles. And he said, well, I just want you to know that you are an invaluable part of my team. I think you're smart. I think you're talented. And if anyone ever says anything to you, makes you feel uncomfortable, looks at you funny, or is, is racist to you in any way, I, I want you to let me know because I'm not going to tolerate that. And I said, I, I really appreciate that, sir. And he said, and I'm going to make you a promise right now. He said, I won't always be able to get you a seat at the table, but I'm always going to make sure that you're in the room. And that, that meant so much to me to hear somebody say that that I was valuable, that, that, that my opinion mattered, that they, they wanted me to be in the room. And it wasn't long after that, I was in a meeting with the governor of Alabama. Um, it was a little bit of an unofficial meeting and my boss was talking to him and some of his economic development advisors. And I was sitting in the corner as a staffer, you know, just taking notes and taking pictures and all that. And the conversation um, uh, moved towards uh, talking about immigration. They start talking about immigration and the impact of their immigrant populations on the state and um, economically and through workforce and all those things. And uh, I was just kind of listening, kind of half listening. And at one point, the governor of Alabama turns to me and he says, well, Josh, your mom is 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 an immigrant, right? Where did you say she was from? I said, the Philippines, sir. And he said, why don't you come over here and you tell us about that? And uh, you could probably provide a lot of insight into our discussion because no one else here has an immigrant family. So We'd love to hear what you have to say. So that was an instance where my boss got me in the room and I ended up having a seat at the table. And I just think about if I weren't there and this conversation came up, and I'm sure these conversations come up a lot in a lot of situations, if I wasn't there, 
who would be advocating for people that looked like me? Who would be advocating for immigrants, for Asian Americans, for Filipino Americans? Nobody. So that is what um, really prompted me uh, to, to get involved in, in um, being in the public sector and, and serving my community is because we Filipino Americans are, are such a such we are a smart, hardworking, invaluable part of our society, and we deserve representation and we deserve our voices being heard. So that's that's what got me involved and that's that's what got me here. And I see I have a few minutes left, but I am going to go ahead and defer those minutes to somebody else and maybe we can use them in Q and A later on. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Josh. Um, let's go next to Jessica. Do you just want me to start talking? Sure. <laughs> um, thanks, Mike, for emceeing. Hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, my name is Jessica Closa. I'm proud to serve on the Board of Public Works in the city of Los Angeles as a commissioner. And I'm proud to serve as the first Filipina American on the board. And uh, similar to Josh's story, you know, I was uplifted by Mayor Eric Garcetti, who is the mayor of the city of Los Angeles. And he's somebody that's been a true champion for the Filipino American community, for the Asian American community. And he's given so many people that look like you and me a seat at the table. And that's really significant for a place like Los Angeles because uh, you saw the numbers that Mike presented from the census data. Um, I'm going to break it down a little bit more just so you understand the significance in Los Angeles. But we have uh, over half a million Filipinos in LA County, and that's the largest number of Filipinos outside of the Philippines. So just think about that for a second. Outside of the Philippines, where do the lambs reside? It's in LA. And so for me, representation in the city is incredibly significant and important because this is where so many immigrant families like mine uh, get their start after immigrating here. And I'm a first generation immigrant. I was born in Quezon City. And since Josh shared his story about how he got into public service and government, um, I'll share mine as well, but I, didn't know what I wanted to be, uh, you know, up until college. I had a really horrific experience of becoming really ill my senior year. Um, so ill that I ended up being hospitalized uh, on my birthday, worst birthday I've ever had uh, out of all days, and ended up being hospitalized for a few weeks and ended up having to drop out that quarter. Uh, from college. And uh, one of the things that I was most worried about uh, was actually not even recovering physically, right? And recovering my health. I was most worried about medical debt and how much being in the hospital was going to cost. And one thing uh, saved me uh, from the amount of medical debt that I would have had and that is the Affordable Care Act. Uh, since I was in college and since I was hospitalized on my birthday, I actually was supposed to phase out of my parents' plan had President Obama not championed Obamacare. And specifically, had he not championed uh, the part of the Affordable Care Act that was very controversial that some of us may remember, which is staying covered under your parents' plan up until you're the age of 26. And I literally made it by just a few months. And for me, that was the wake up call that I needed uh, to understand what my calling was. Uh, and it showed me how important public policy is, uh, how it's a safety net for a lot of people like me who were perfectly healthy and then one day got really sick. And that's just one example in healthcare, but there's so many important issues, whether it's with student loans or, you know, it is with other industries of really important cases about why public policy is so important and why we need to uh, uplift leaders that uh, if they don't look like us, 
um, at least that they fight for us because for me, that's what happened. And so that story that Mike shared of how I ended up working on his campaign is, is uh, true. And that's why I answered the way that I did when they asked me what I would do for the president is after that experience, all I wanted to do was give back and to serve and to help as many people as I could. So when I, uh, they asked me what city would be most convenient to me, that was the wrong question uh, to be asked, at least from my perspective. And I, I just asked like, tell me where you need the most help uh, tell me where I can serve and like that's where I'll go. And they sent me to rural Virginia so I can totally uh, relate to some of the stories that Josh is saying because I had to organize uh, in rural Virginia. I'd never been there and I was also the only Asian American in many of the cities and counties that I helped organize. And uh, it's tough but that is the hard work that we need to do so that we can participate in the process because uh, we can't think about policy until we actually uh, win and until we actually uh, help elect leaders that we know on the policy end are going to fight for us. And so that's a little bit about my story and how I got started in public service and in politics and government. And uh, ever since then, I ended up serving in the Obama administration and then after serving in DC for a few years I was just really homesick and wanted to move back to California and Los Angeles and there was only one person I wanted to work for who just made me hopeful about elected leaders and the hope that they have to make things better not for the future but for right now right and that was Mayor Garcetti. And so I've been very fortunate in his administration to serve in a number of roles. And now as a commissioner, uh, I like to say that if you can uh, turn on your lights, take a shower, uh, take out your trash and walk your dog on the sidewalk, that's public works. So it's all the things that you touch and feel and use every single day that you may not know is public works until it's broken. So that's what I do, and I get to serve 4 million residents providing critical city services, and I also get to handle our infrastructure portfolio. Um, so I get to work on bridge projects, infrastructure projects uh, for the second largest city in the country. And so I'm just proud to serve, to serve and represent our community. Uh, and, you know, with that, I will pass it back over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you. And um, as a county manager, I certainly understand that line that Jessica did mention that it's all the stuff that you don't want to worry about until it's actually broken. And then that's when everybody complains and yells. So, you know, thank you for, uh, for that service uh, to LA. Um, let's go over to Sergio now. Kamusa, everyone, and Mabuhai, and good afternoon. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to, to be here. Um, my name is Sergio Alcobilli. I'm in Honolulu, Hawaii. And it's just so great to hear some of these stories from Jessica and from Josh about these things that, that bind us together. Uh, this really this calling of service uh, because of our backgrounds, because of our history. We have this, this sense of wanting to serve, wanting to give back. Uh, a little bit about my story. Um, I was born in the Philippines. My father was a military officer. My mom was a nurse. Uh, for me, one of the first or the earliest memories I remember was, uh, you know, during the elections of 1986. I know a lot of people here maybe weren't born during that time, but um, for me, as a sec as a six-year-old kid, I remember sneaking out and attending one of the political rallies uh, that was being held at, at our town plaza. And I just remember just the craziness of the whole situation and people singing and dancing and just having a good time. But uh, you know, just that month, of February 1986, that was just it was such a formative year for me. Um, for me, that was also uh, the month and, and the year that my, my father was uh, assassinated. Um, you know, as a military officer, he was uh, became a target of a communist hit squad. Um, and then, uh, sorry, sometimes I, I do <laughs> I have a hard time just talking about this, but uh, you know, for for me, um, I just I still remember that evening. Uh, you know, we, we, he was a block or two away from our house and. 
uh, I can just, I still remember the gunfire and the gunshots and just wondering you know, what the heck's going on and us being rushed uh, into a bathroom and um, us turning off the lights and making sure that, uh, you know, we weren't next. Um, but, you know, uh, we found out later that evening that my, my dad and a few of his men were gunned down by a, by a hit squad. And um, a few days later, uh, Edsa broke out. Uh, my mom was in the United States at the time. She was working as a nurse. Uh, you know, she needed to make um, some money. Uh, you know, my dad was just, uh, couldn't really live on his military salary. Um, so my mom was here working as a nurse. And she came back, uh, buried my dad. She was uh, five, you know, three months pregnant uh, with my youngest brother. And um, here she is now, a, a widow, uh, you know, with five kids and then uh, six one on the way. Um, and for her trying to figure out what she's going to do next, uh, you no, know, luckily she was one of those nurses that came to the United States in the seventies. And for her, that was, uh, you know, that was an opportunity for us, uh, to move on from this. But, uh, you know, I remember a story, uh, you know, about my, my dad, uh, my mom had asked him to come to the United States just because he was getting so dangerous and in, in the Philippines. And one of his responses was, you know, why would he come to the United States and, and be treated as a second class citizen? You know, when here in the Philippines, you know, he was a military officer that was respected. And, and you know, that story has stuck with me uh, just throughout the years, growing up in all different parts of the country, growing up in the deep south as well in Florida, uh, being the only Asian American you know, in, a, in a town that was divided by the railroad tracks. Um, and that's, that's just stuck with me uh, this time. But for us growing up in, in this country as an immigrant family, with six kids and my mom is a single parent working multiple jobs and just trying to find ways, um, you know, to, to make ends meet. So I don't know if you're one of those Filipino families where your mom has done everything from selling Tupperware to selling Amway and, you know, um, whatever community marketing program there is next. Uh, I think our, my, our families tried it on. So I tried it all, but just that experience of knowing kind of the hardships, knowing just the struggle, um, you know, for me, that's really what motivates me uh, to give back, uh, just because I know I wouldn't be where I am today um, if it wasn't, if it weren't for people, you know, that helped us along the way, if it weren't for teachers that believed in me, if it weren't for, you know, friends and neighbors that helped us. And uh, for me, just that, just that sense that we do belong in this country, that we don't have to be treated as a second class citizen, uh, you know, that we have just every right as, as any other person, any other race to be in this country. Um, for me, those are important, you know, that we, we stand up for those, uh, and really, um, you know, what, what brought me to where I am today, uh, you know, I, I want to point it back to my experience in 2019 with Philpro. Uh, you know, we had our government day and, uh, you know, we had a chance to visit, uh, the ATA community, um, you know, uh, near Manila. And just for me, just seeing those, uh, you know, just seeing those families and the children, and it just reminded me of what it, a privilege it is for us to be here in the United States. What a privilege it is for us to be able to choose our careers, choose the paths we want to follow. That so many people in the Philippines would gladly trade places for us, uh, with us. And that for me, it just gave me a sense of responsibility. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't waste this opportunity, you know, out of selfishness or out of fear. Uh, you know, I've got to do everything that I can uh, to help my community, uh, to help my people, uh, and just to, to help make this place better. And, you know, when someone had asked me uh, before to, if I was ever interested in running for office, a lot of times, I, you know, I quickly said no. I was, uh, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing in the nonprofit world. But uh, for me, it was just, a, I think it was a sense of fear. You know, I, I didn't think I had the qualifications. I didn't think I belonged. Uh, you know, and just that sense of fear. But just that experience being in the Philippines just it just gave me a sense of courage that, you know what, we've got a duty, we've got a responsibility. We're in this country, we've got to be part of this country. You know, it's not enough for us just to, to be quiet on the side and, and, you know, work hard and put our heads down. Uh, you know, we've got to speak up. And that's the thing that I learned with, uh, it was a session with, that Dr. Abby had put together um, yesterday that, you know, part of our culture is we, we tend not to speak up. Uh, we tend not to, to rock the boat. You know, we want to be that, that model minority where our parents are 
telling us to work hard, get straight A's, learn, Eng learn English, and lose your accent. Um, but, you know, for me to be a Filipino and to be an American, you know, we can't, that's how I reconcile my two cultures. You know, we're called not just to rock the boat, but we're called to, to drive the boat. You know, we're called to, to steer the boat forward. And, and for me, that's, uh, it's giving me the courage to where I am today to take that risk and just really at the end of the day, just to do it, uh, you know, with a sense of wanting to serve, wanting to help people and wanting to give back to my community. Thank you. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Mike. All right, Sergio, thank you. Um, Stephen, let's go have you uh, close up the, at least the panel discussion uh, at this point. Oh, OK. Uh, hey, guys. Um, uh, thanks for joining. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for all the other speakers. Um, and uh, thanks, Mike, for, for hosting. Uh, my name is Steve Raga. I'm here in, uh, in, in New York. And um, yeah, I've been, been involved with the, with the community on, on, on multiple levels and the Filipino community started with the, the um, student association here at, at Stony Brook where I went for undergrad and um, got my uh, master's in policy. Uh, there, I just got more involved because my friends were, uh, my friends were in the Filipino student organization. So I'm gonna hang out with my friends. Uh, I got more friends. Uh, then we were involved with the regional Filipino um organization then we were in the national uh well fine um in which case i i was i've you know just for the t officers for president or chair or the national chair i had to go through elections and and one president regional director uh, national chair and that's just you know when you're in college and do, doing doing that being uh being a good filipino in in, in college uh afterwards um i started started interning locally at Filipino organizations and entities. I actually, at one time, I was an intern at uh, the Philippine Forum, which was a more grassroots, uh, progressive organization. And at the same time, at the Philippine Consulate, <laughs> like at, at the same summer. And um, it was a really uh, eye opening uh, experience then. But in my time there, that's when I saw that every other organizations, uh, that the non Filipino organizations, every other um, even non API organizations were getting a large part of uh, our taxpayer uh, uh, money that's supposed to be divvied out between our nonprofit entities. Uh, there were no in language services materials uh, for Filipinos. Uh, only one real uh, community center in in New York, uh, when in, in Queens, when it's uh, the hub of the Filipino American community, especially at that time. Uh, you can make an argument for Jersey uh, uh, now, but uh, again, not a lot of the resources that's proportionate to our community and and what we bring to the table, not just in in Queens, but all in New York City, all of uh, New York State. So fast forward a bit um, uh, in terms of representation in, in, in government here for, for our Filipino American community. Um, it's it it, it varies. Uh, it, it's we've been doing well in the uh, re, uh, as of late in uh, Mayor De Blasio's administration. I think there was f maybe three Filipina uh, commissioners uh, overseeing HUD small business. It was Maria Torres Springer who who left recently, um, and uh, human rights, and also. Um, the mayor's off, uh, office of uh, uh, the entertainment, <laughs> the entertainment office with the with the movies, and also the chief technology officer was Filipina too, um, Minerva Tantaco. So that's three, eight, four agencies, in which Filipinas were were uh, the top person and individual in charge. Great. Also, in the last few years, um, on the state legislature, uh, me, I, I was the first Filipino chief of staff at the state state legislature, where I, which I held for four years. Um, right now, there's another one. Um, uh, so there's at, right now currently one more person making sure New York State's uh, getting these laws and and, and helping out um, helping out folks, and and so that representation does matter because like everyone else here would would know that really gatekeepers into resources into our, our community, uh, just just not even financial, just uh, representation and recognition at the very least um, and open those uh, open those doors also I'm, I'm involved in a community board 
to. It's like the town councils on, on, on a, like in the county level in, in New York. And um, my, that jurisdiction where I've sat on since 2016, it oversees Long Island City, Astoria, Sunnyside, and Woodside. And that is overwhelmingly one of the largest API uh, or largest, fastest growing API uh, communities in New York City. New York Times just had Long Island City as the quickest API growing neighborhood in all of New York City. Uh, Woodside is from, from the 60s, the kind of the home and the center of of the Filipino community. Uh, you all have family that, not you, but like if you're in New York, you have, you have family that, that's lived here uh went through here um or if not by the a reason you don't you um uh you're here for the food anyway uh you're here for events anyway you're here for community anyway so it's uh very important to to have that sort of representation and get to and happy to to do do so on at least on the community board level which was a, a big thing for me because when i came in there were there was a, a building that was trying to rezone right in the heart of of the Filipino community in Little Manila here in Woodside. And uh, if that would rezone, that could have um, a domino effect on the Filipino small businesses and the houses here in terms of property value, in terms of of uh, rental uh, pricing and might've you know, started a gentrification in, in our neighborhood, in which case all the other surrounding neighborhoods, Elmhurst, um, Jackson Heights, Sunnyside has, our, and especially Long Island City has already been that. So. Or, or been doing that so we're kind of a prime target and it's a good time to to protect our community now and recently um as of late i uh, kind of threw my uh name in there to to run for city council uh to represent here in, in the primary earlier this year and came in a little late um a lot of the, the latest but still matched and and qualified for everything uh, although of the extreme lateness and not because it was not part of plan or anything, but at that time, um, I don't know if it news outside New York, uh, Noel Cantana, a Filipino uh, here in, in New York was on the train and he got slashed across the face. Uh, the mayor kind of downplayed it. And um, the Filipino community was, uh, was pretty upset. A lot of folks telling me to, you know, there's not enough representation in city hall for us, let alone in a campaign, let alone in the neighborhood where the Filipinos are, we need to to have that at least in the discussion, and I think you know um, you can only say no to uh, these Filipino titas for for a little uh, for for so long. They're gonna get you eventually. So um, ended up filing and, and and running that race. Did a good job. Proud of uh, the team, which is majority um, all people of color, Filipinos too, intergenerational, um, which also brought little uh, you know fun little uh, um, challenges uh, that we could talk about later, uh, but. Um, but still, uh, again, in New York City, in New York State, uh, on, there has never been a, a represent a elected official on that level, on the city council level, on the state legislature uh, level, and that's something that uh, New York is is kind of behind in. And parts of that is that we're a closed primary state, just next door in Jersey. Um, uh, they, they have a few elected officials there, Filipino descent. Uh, Rolando Lavaro, until uh, earlier this week, was our you know, long time a council member there. And, um, or I, I mean, he still is, and he, um, he has a, a, you know, end of, uh, he can finish the rest of his term. But um, the reason of that is because it's an open primary. You don't have to be Republican, Democrat, <laughs> independent. You can just go for it. Uh, in New York, it's strongly, strongly uh, leans Democrat. And it's New York City's particular is 95% Democrat. So if we're not in the primaries, you know, we got a, you know, we're not going to make it to the general. I still have every day I go outside and people say, Hey, Steve, I'm going to vote. Well, not now because the election was last week, <laughs> early this week, but until Tuesday, Hey, Steve, I got you. I'm going to vote for you. I'm like, how, how guys, that was in June. That's not how this, this works. Um, but again, it's kind of like what was said earlier. It's, you just got to keep, keep going. Um, and, uh, and they hit a point where a lot of folks were like, well, this is the kind of the home of the Filipino community. Do we do we kind of like try to win without them or because we might lose with them? What is what, what, how do we balance that out? Um, and that was something uh, the campaign kind of faced on, on a regular basis because there's a lot of, you know, the back uh, the, the back education we had to do for our community. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, all good still. I mean, I live right in, I live in Woodside. I see across the streets, all the Filipino restaurants and I'm happy to keep, uh, uh, keep active, um, especially in my new role as executive director as Woodside on the Move. It's a 50 year old um, uh, entity that, that oversees uh, the neighborhood and in, in advocacy policy and, and the like. So it's a good, uh, good place to be in and bring the Filipino community into the larger space. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've heard from all of our panelists uh, this uh, this morning, evening, afternoon, um, and we now have time and opportunity for questions uh, for for the panelists. Um, so, from what I understand, there's two ways to be able to ask a question: either using the the Q and A box uh, on the right side of your screen, or if you raise your hand, we can actually uh, turn on your video and you can come and join the panel to uh, ask a question directly. So. While you folks formulate uh, questions uh, for the particular uh, for a particular panelist or for the panel in general, um, I'll ask a general question to the panel to get started uh, with the question and answer session. Um, so, do you believe a culture of government service can be engendered in our Filipino community? Um, Josh, why don't we start off with you? Well, goodness, I sure hope so. But no, I, I really do. In fact, I've, I've said this before, and I think Filipinos um, really are like uh, very ripe for being involved in public service. Uh, Filipinos, we are a compassionate people. Um, but also, if you look at the history of the Philippines, um, from Spanish colonialism to being in American territory, um, Filipinos already kind of inherently understand, I think, the way the government structure is because it's very similar in the Philippines with a president and a vice president and senators and, and governors. And so in the election process as well, because it was set up by, by the United States at the time. So um, and then, you know, Philippines, um, English is one of the official language and, and almost all Filipinos speak English to some degree. So it, it, to me, it seems like a natural fit that Filipino Americans would... Um, would be great getting involved into politics and government um, because it's a little bit more of an understanding, I think, of, of the United States uh, political system and and um, all that that entails. So, um, yeah. And, you know, also Filipinos, we care a lot about our community. And um, I think it's just about uh, it's that feeling of Kapwa. Right. And I think it's just extending that um, past past our community, but to to encompass the whole community and also to be able to have that seat at the table. Um, and to be able to, as, as Jessica said, as um, Sergio and Steven said, help make those policy decisions, help uh, um, get those resources and funnel them towards Filipino communities where they could best be needed. Um, I actually spoke at, a, at a, a, a small Filipino event. There was about 40 people, a bunch of titas and titos. We just had some food and we were having a good time. But um, out of the 40 that were there, we got 12 to register to vote that night. And they said that they had never registered to vote in 30, 40 years that they had been citizens because nobody had ever asked them to. And, and that just blew my mind that they were willing to be engaged, but nobody had reached out to engage them. And then when they kind of asked, what's the importance of voting? I said, look, um, you're all hard workers. You pay your taxes. Don't you think you should have a say where that tax money is going? Is it going to schools? Is it going to hospitals? Is it going to parks? all these wonderful public works projects that uh, Commissioner Coloza works on, or would you rather go to something that maybe you don't approve of or don't care about? So that that really kind of triggered something in them. And um, they, again, 12 people registered to vote at a party that had 40 people. So to me, that was a huge win. And um, I think that the Filipino community, again, is, is ripe for jumping in and getting involved in the local government and politics. Okay. Great, Josh. Uh, Jessica, you have any thoughts on that question? Just a little. Um, I think, as Josh mentioned, our culture is so oriented to helping others uh, and serving the greater community. We've seen that in the last 19 months. Uh, before, it was kind of like a half joke, right? Like, your mom is a nurse, my mom is a nurse, but it's not funny anymore because our Filipino nurses like save lives, right? They they were the backbone of uh, our healthcare industry during the pandemic. And we need to make sure that our community is protected because 
what happens with Filipino nurses and Filipinos in the healthcare industry is really true for a lot of industries, right? Filipinos are kind of like magnets, right? Once you get one Filipino into an industry or into a workplace, like 20, 30 more will follow. And that's a, a great thing. Uh, in some ways, and it's also one that signals to me in public service that we make up entire sectors. We make up entire industries. And who will protect our community when they are most vulnerable, like in the last 18 months? And the decisions that we make in government as regulators, as policymakers, um, is either going to help or hurt communities. And if we want to help communities, we need to be the ones speaking for our, from our lived experience, uh, from the stories that we heard growing up, from the stories that we have ourselves to make these decisions. And so one of the best things that we can do is have forums like this to invest in organizations like PhilPro so that we can continue sharing our story so that when there is uh, a young Filipino girl or Filipino boy trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up, that this is top of mind for them in their psyche, that they see our faces, that we work in government, that we work in politics, and that they can be what they see. And that's us. And that's really important to talk about because there is a report that came out earlier this year that talked about uh, representation of minority communities in politics and in government. And this is where we rank the lowest is Asian Americans. And the data wasn't broken out. So I didn't see what the Filipino numbers were. But within the broader Asian American community, we are the most underrepresented community in the country. Uh, the most underrepresented group within the Asian American community among elected office are Asian American women. We make up less than 1%, <laughs> less than 1% of all elected seats in the country. And that is uh, a statistic that I know a lot of us are going to work really hard to uh, fight the narrative against and beat. And I hope that uh, if you're listening or watching, that you take away how you can get engaged so that we can get more Filipinos in our pipeline, uh, whether that's starting off uh, serving on a commission, like what I've done uh, in my current role or what Josh has done previously, or starting and being an intern or being a staff person. Um, but reach out to us so that we can help uh, share our experiences with you and show you how to get your foot in the door, right? And that's really what it's about for our community is we need to get as many people through the door as possible so that we can start making decisions um, for our community with our community. And so uh, that's a very long answer to your question, Mike. But yes, uh, we, we can definitely create that culture. And I think we're doing it right now. Yeah. Oh. Perfect answer. Thank you. Stephen, you got thoughts on that question as well? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I've seen it here in, in, in New York during the pandemic. I mean, Elmhurst Hospital, which was the epicenter of the epicenter at the height of, of, of COVID-19 here, is it's it's five blocks away from me right now. So it, it's the community that was impacted the most were people of color, were immigrants, and were in our neighborhood. And those nurses that were there were were Filipino. Um, the nurse across across uh, the city here, uh, when it was at its worst, were um, you know Filipinos were in, were everywhere. And at the same time, when nobody was going to their restaurants because no one wanted to come out, the Filipino restaurants in the in the neighborhood de developed the culture of service where yeah, no rest no no customers were coming in, but they would make the food anyway. And um, with the help of community volunteers would deliver that food to those who need it, um, including the hospitals here for the frontline uh, workers and, and the nurses and healthcare workers. So um, I think it's there. Uh, we, we have shown that the community can come together and, and, and serve. Uh, I think it's just 
making sure that it's it you know we provide an infrastructure uh for that that culture to be sustained in a longer time frame and like again it goes to what like jessica said is to have events like this um but then let's see if we could take it a step further okay thanks david um again just as a reminder to those that are watching if, if you do want to ask a question uh you can either put in the q a uh, feed or you can raise your hand um i'll ask another question um to the panel um Wait, sorry can, yeah. I, can i add to this real quick i'll keep it brief sure yeah, I think for, for us, you know, we need to remember we're strong people. Um, you know, I, I look at my mom, I look at uh, the nurses that have been working multiple hours. Um, you know, I look at our uh, OFW workers that are working in other countries that have left their families behind in the Philippines. We've got to remember we're strong people. We're also a people of heart. We're, you know, a, a people, uh, you know, who serve. Um, and let's not forget that. I, I think when we are maybe our parents' generation and our parents' generation and those that came before us, there was this sense that when they came to America, you know, they've got to keep their head down and just work hard. Um, you know, maybe there was that feeling of inferiority that maybe they didn't know as much as, you know, other races. But I think for us, it's, it's time for us to, to shed kind of that type of thinking. And it's, you know, as I see other Asian Americans, uh, you know, winning spots and, you know, as, uh, across the country and other political offices. I mean, for us, we've been here first. Uh, you know, there's no reason for us to be at the bottom. You know, we were in on this continent before other, you know, before other Asian American races. So let's remember that, that we're strong people. We belong in these spaces. We belong in these races just as much as anyone else. And we're just as qualified as anyone else. So I just wanted to add that. Sorry about uh, skipping you, Sergio, but thanks for that, <laughs> that response on that. Um, Melanie has uh, joined, and uh, do you have a question for the panel, uh, either for the full panel or somebody specifically? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Melanie. I am tuning in from Duwamish land here in Seattle, Washington, and I feeling so much fire from this panel. So thank you all for making the time to be here. I have a question around engaging our elders in this process. So I'm really interested in local government and I work at a public policy institution here at the University of Washington. And often I find that the hardest conversations I've been having are with my family. So, you know, I have um, relatives who are nurses, who are doctors in the medical field, and then I have relatives who don't believe in the vaccine. Uh, and then, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, it's a lot of anti-Blackness and being met with a lot of opposition. So for those of us who are trying to engage our elders in this process of civic engagement and voting and using their voice, like, what advice do you have? Thank you. That's an excellent question, Melody. Let's go ahead and, uh, Sergio, why don't I start off with you uh, on this question? And we'll work the panel. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think for us, it's just letting them know that it's a sense of responsibility it's to be in this country. Uh, you know, we've got to participate. It's not enough for us just to be on the sidelines. You know, that's not what this country is about. Uh, this country requires civic participation, civic engagement. Um, and I think when, when we can convey it's the sense of responsibility, I think our elders, they have that that deep feeling that, yes, they, you know, they want to fulfill their responsibility. Um, for me, that's usually where I try to start the conversation. Uh, I've met elders that have been in this country for, you know, 40, 30 years, and they've never registered to vote. Uh, you know, they just didn't think that it was their responsibility or that they had a say in anything or they had a voice. Um, and that's where I'd start the conversation is that it's just that sense of responsibility. And it, it is a duty, uh, you know, as a Filipino American that we participate in the process. Um, Jessica, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, it's a really important one in like, how do we communicate with our community across multiple generations? I think for me, how I try to communicate with the older generation, especially if they're, um, I may have very different views around policy and politics and government than I do, is I try to engage them um, through experiences. I say that, and I mean that I, I can only talk to them so much and say so many words to them and it's not going to make a difference, right? It's not going to make an impact. And when I think about the most formative, um, lessons for me and, and, and how I changed my mindset on certain issues 
or change the trajectory of being in public service is I had to experience it, right? I, I, I had to do more than hear it. I had to literally go through the experience. And so for the older generation, I try to share experiences with them instead of just stories. I try to bring them to a rally. I try to come have them join us and break bread over dinner. I would like to invite them to events with uh, our first Filipino American Attorney General of California, Rob Bonta, right? Like I bring them to these experiences to be inspired and to be moved because I know that I'm not going to be the, the biggest advocate for changing their minds. You know, it's going to be everybody else in the community that they hear from. You know, if I've said something, you know, five times to them already and they still nothing has moved, me saying it another 15 times isn't going to matter. And so that's what I would think about is what experiences can you really immerse them in to help promote that culture shift and that mindset shift? Um, kind of like what Philpro was to a lot of people, right? We didn't talk about just going to the Philippines and we didn't just talk about reconnecting with our culture. We experienced it. And people need to have these experiences in order to uh, move forward. And so for me, that's how I address it with uh, the community organizing that I do um, here in LA is I, I really try to engage everyone in the process and bring them in uh, when we have different events, different conversations, rallies, uh, round tables, show them who their elected officials are, engage them in the process so they see and they hear. And it starts out small. And the next thing you know, they're so involved and they're so engaged and they've changed their mind and they didn't even know it. And that's the best part. So that would be my advice. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephen, do you have any uh, thoughts on Melody's question? Yeah, but I don't know if I have enough time to to answer all, all that. I, I got a lot of thoughts. Is 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 what I'm saying? Uh, how to talk to the older generation? Uh, uh, I mean, it's it, it's a lot. I mean, it, it it depends also when they immigrated here. Their their social economic status. Their uh, you know how involved in they are in the community. There's there's all these variables that are um, that that are out there, and and someone really needs to do. A study on this because every day someone asks me how do we talk to the older generation or i see a meme about it or a private post about it I, it's, it's something that we got we really got to get together and, and put our heads about uh but i mean yes uh we do have to uh involve them in in what we're doing and it, it really I, honestly it's like again i agree with jessica we got to immerse them in some of the experiences that we're doing not just in in political office or or government um, if, if, uh, agency events or entity events, but just like, even just the good like community organizing or advocacy being done by maybe younger folks. Uh, I, I remember a few years ago um, there was a, a Unipro had a, a a conference here in New York, and there was a senior Filipino Seniors Association Pagasa at the time that came that came by. There was like three of them, four of them, and they were just like, yeah, literally. Uh, this was us when we were your age. We're just here <laughs> trying, to, trying to see how we can help you and 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 support you. Uh, we just didn't know that this was an option. Like we, uh, we and eventually they were getting their friends to register to vote. Eventually they were getting their I don't know where what they registered, but they definitely registered to vote. And and also trying to get them to um, go out there to the polls when when needed to to get our voice uh, out there. On the other hand, I think a part of that is. And I'm I'm saying that specifically from my experience and and just the lack of of the elected representation in lawmaking for for New York is that that also reflects in in who goes out there to vote. So knowing those the actual election laws and and what what you have to do to get our people in there that's a whole nother thing. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of older people excited uh, to support in in the city council race, and it was all old school Filipino tactics. And then if you didn't want to use it. Oh, guess what? You hate Filipinos. No, I just don't want to spend uh, money to buy leather jackets with my name on it and have people wear it on the seven train. I don't think that's a viable option, Tito. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, there, there was, there's a lot of things we got we to gotta work on over there. But I'll tell you, if the opportunity is there, 
I think a, a lot of folks would would love to uh, would love to participate. So just a little bit more of reaching out and and taking that first step. Great. Thanks, David. Josh, uh, any thoughts on Moni's question? Yeah, I'm going to be really brief. Um, I think everyone already kind of said the, the answer, but Jessica really took the words out of my mouth. I think you just take those folks and you immerse them in it. Um, I have taken um, my mom to um, predominantly black events. And afterwards, she th said, you know what? Now I understand racism in the South. Now I understand Jim Crow. Um, and, and that's just the way to do it. You know, sometimes it's out of sight, out of mind. And until, um, Jessica said, you've lived that experience, you know, so I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of, yeah, don't tell me, show me and, and try to get them to come out to those spaces and, uh, break bread, uh, listen to other people's stories, listen to their experiences. Um, I even had an experience with, um, and I was here, I was election commissioner and I took my mom to vote and I'm um, in Arkansas, you have to show a photo ID. So she showed her driver's license. And then afterwards, the poll worker said, well, wait a minute, I need to see your passport, too, to make sure you're a U.S. citizen. And I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> I said, no, you don't. That's wrong. You don't need to show any more, any more ID. But we were in that situation. And after that, she, we were in the car and she told me, she said, now I'm seeing the voter suppression. Because if you weren't there as an election commissioner and knew that that was not appropriate, she said, I would have probably went home and got my passport and came back, or maybe I would have went home and not got my passport and got discouraged and said, never mind. So, um, yeah, I agree with uh, what, what everyone has said previously, especially Jessica, just take, take those folks and try to put them in that place so they can experience for themselves. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Um, we do have a question from uh, the chat. Uh, and uh, this speaker, uh, actually it's Melissa, um, she's saying thank you for your public service. What types of data or stories are most helpful to bring policymakers when advocating uh, for the needs of the Filipino community? Any recommendations for your go-to sources of this data? Um, Stephen, why don't we start off with you on this question and we'll go around the panel. Yeah, sure. I think uh, for me, I think that the source of, or all the, research at least in 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 new york city is at first is is the census and so we really had to kind of get our folks there to, to register which i know they kind of really really don't on a regular basis and so those resources in the government and that's the numbers they directly use or or the next study is going to use in which the government's gonna is is going to lean on to to see how they're going to allocate resources or legislate uh the budget or vote on the budget so um i the sources of data is for me is always uh for new york it's two things it's um the census um and and also uh, new york city has a specific uh Open NYC net that they have their data, and three Asian American Federation in New York has a, a some a wealth of uh, data as well. Sergio, you want to jump in and uh, answer the question? Sure, Mike. Just very brief. Uh, here in Hawaii, we're very fortunate that you know we have leaders in government uh, like Mike, you know that people can look to that um, that know the experiences of of the Filipino community. But uh, here in Hawaii, um, as Mike had mentioned, we're, there's also a large Filipino population here. So for me, it's just, you know, when we go to a rally at the Capitol, I just bring the numbers. You know, when people see the Titos and the Titos outside um, that are part of these uh, labor unions, they know that they're for real. Um, you know, it's not just stories to them, but it's real people. Uh, so for me, just having that, I guess that, you know, being grateful that we do have the numbers here where we can have uh, mass support by bringing, by letting people know that these are real people with real stories. Jessica, you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, and just to clarify, her to Craig, she she um, they're asking about like some sources for data, right? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So one of my favorite um, sites that I use when I look up data, because this is really important if you're in government or in politics or in honestly in any profession, right, to back up what it is we're advocating for. Um, and I like to use aapidata.com. Um, let me just make sure. Yeah. aapidata.com. And that takes census data and it breaks it down to the state level. It breaks it down by different ethnic groups, 
uh, including the Filipino American community, which I find extremely helpful. And it does a lot of analysis um, at the micro level, at the macro level about the AAPI population. And that's one of my go-to sources. And in the second one that I'll plug here, we didn't talk about it, but we all know and have seen the news that there's been over 9,000 incidents of anti-Asian hate crimes that have been reported since last March. And that has also been uh, an incredible data point that so many of us have used to advocate for more resources for the Asian American and Filipino American community and that stop AAPI hate. And so that has incredibly rich information at the state level and for some big cities like LA, New York, they do have some specific metrics about the incidents and crimes reported against Asian Americans. And there's also some narratives in there, um, some of which did have some Filipino specific narrative from testimonials of people who were reporting hate crimes. And so I encourage um, in the use of those two resources, those are the ones that I use to help me advocate for the work that I do in LA. So I hope that's helpful. Josh, you have any sources that you can share maybe? I think a, a lot of them have been covered, but I do agree with Jessica, depending on what you want to do, um, just from my federal experience, I know when people were asking for grants for various groups um, across the Delta or in different states, um, we always wanted to see data points to back them up. Um, census data is very useful. Um, any of these third parties that are gathering data. Um, I know it's very hard to get um, Asian Americans and Filipino Americans in particular to fill out the census sometimes. So there's a lot of gaps there. Um, I've also found, um, well, this is in Arkansas, but uh, our Division of Workforce Services, so I'm sure other states have, have similar uh, uh, agencies that, that track data, especially with employment and, um, and different industries. So that may be one um, other resource, depending on what kind of information you're looking for. Um, and if it's in the medical field, I mean, you can also look into... Um, I know there's different nursing associations, doctors associations, so um, that are also tracking some of that information as well. But I guess it just really depends on it, what it is you're trying to do. But I would say that if you're trying to um, advocate for any community or, or even write a grant to benefit a community, it's, it's so important to have those data points to back it up that this is the current needs of the community. This is what it looks like. If we were to get this money or get this funding, this is what we could do. Um, so I, I always use a kind of a past, present, and future model. Um, this is what it looks like. This is what we're doing. If we had this money, we could do X, Y, and Z, and it would be wonderful. Okay, thanks, Josh. Well, we are coming up to the top of the hour. It's uh, 3 p.m. Hawaii time shortly. Um, I still have another two hours before I can hit the bar, but for the rest of you on the U.S. continent, um, go at it and have a great weekend. Um, let's just show a round of, of uh, I guess, virtual applause for everybody that's on the panel. If you can click your uh, reaction buttons and just give them a uh, I guess a sign of aloha, as we say here in Hawaii. And we just want to uh, mahalo again, Josh, Jessica, Steven, and Sergio for spending their time and being able to share uh, some of their, their thoughts and their wisdom uh, about some of their, uh, their experiences and trying to get us motivated to uh, work on behalf of our community. So with that, you folks all have a great weekend and uh, please continue to fight. Aloha. Hi.